we've got a nice bright day in Swansea for a change, maybe a bit too bright. But hey, it's letting a bit of light in here. So, this week I've been talking a bit about the anatomy of the breast, of the female breast, more than the male breast. Um, and next week it comes up in teaching as well, so I thought this was an ideal opportunity to talk about the anatomy of the breast. So, the structure of the breast is fairly straightforward, but we'll talk about that. So we'll talk about the gland um, and the tissue and the skin, and we'll talk about what gives shape and size. But probably most importantly, we'll talk about the normal changes that you would expect through life, and then how cancers, how tumours can interact with those structures and cause abnormal or unusual changes to the breast. So if you're working with a patient, one of the hardest questions to answer is, is this normal? So if you know that these changes normally occur during life, then you can be more confident in saying that these changes are normal when you see them. But if you see abnormal changes, then you'll know why those abnormal changes are occurring and your mind will start worrying about da, ba, 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 these other things, okay? So structure of the breast, normal changes, abnormal changes. I always aim to try and keep these videos to 10 minutes, but they always end up as 20 minutes. I wonder why. We'll see how we go with this one. So I've got a couple of models of the female breast at different stages. Um, this is the, the adult female breast, but non-active, non-lactating. This is the adult female breast in the lactating stage, and these split open so we can have a look inside. The female breast is made up of largely fat. So fat content within the breast determines the size of the breast. There is some glandular tissue, but otherwise there's quite a bit of duct tissue um, and connective tissue. And the connective tissue then um, confers the shape of the breast. Um, and some of these structures are also apparent before puberty, and some of them are apparent in the male and female breast. Here we see a series of lactiferous ducts. These ducts are individually draining a mammary gland. These are inactive mammary glands, so nothing's really happening right now. And there's not a lot of glandular tissue. And if you look at the histology, you'll see there's, there's a lot of connective tissue, a lot of fat, very sparse areas of glandular tissue and ducts and what have you. Um, each gland, though, has its own lactiferous duct, or each mammary gland lobule have it, has its own lactiferous duct. And if each breast has 15 to 20 mammary gland lobules, there are 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts. And here's the nipple, surrounded by the areola. Those 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts open individually at the nipple. So in the lactating breast, when milk is being produced, if one of those lactiferous ducts becomes blocked, becomes occluded, for example, with inflammation from mastitis, then the other ducts will remain open, they'll remain patent, so milk will still be able to flow. And they all open individually at the nipple. Now, the areola around the nipple um, is a different colour, it's a slightly different uh, form of skin, but it has a number of modified sebaceous glands within it. So sebaceous in glands in the skin produce sebum, so they produce that oily substance that protects the skin. So these, these modified sebaceous glands in the areola will protect the areola and the nipple during breastfeeding. And while we're talking about glands, um, the mammary glands are considered to be modified sweat glands modified apocrine glands. The implication of that is that while many glands are surrounded by a fairly tough or some form of fibrous or connective tissue capsule, sweat glands are not and the mammary glands in the breast are not surrounded by a capsule, which means that if epithelial cells of the gland or of the lactiferous ducts um, go into uncontrolled proliferation and start to form a mass, then that mass can invade surrounding tissues relatively easily and it will invade blood vessels and lymphatic um, ducts and some of the connective tissue we're going to talk about. Uh, so with early breast cancer, we're talking, about, we're talking about these mammary glands and ducts. We're talking about DCIS and LCIS. So DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, all carcinomas come from epithelial cells. Um, so that's a, 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 an early carcinoma from, from the epithelial cells of a duct, of a lactiferous duct, and those cells have not yet invaded surrounding tissues. That's an early form of carcinoma from these lactiferous ducts. LCIS, uh, lobular carcinoma in situ, 
is a carcinoma formed from the epithelial cells of the mammary gland lobules. And again, it hasn't invaded surrounding tissues yet. If the cancer becomes larger, it becomes an invasive um, cancer. So the other structure we've got inside the breast is, well, the other, the other structures to look at are, here is the pectoralis muscle here. So the breast is overlying largely pectoralis major. And the breast, irrespective of the shape or the size of the breast, um, the, the, the female breast tends to be anchored to the thoracic wall between the lateral, just lateral to the sternum, the mid axillary line, between about ribs two and six. Um, and it overlies largely pectoralis major, but also other muscles of the chest wall. Blood supply then is, well, it can receive blood from the intercostal arteries, but it'll also probably most famously receive blood from the internal uh, thoracic artery, which also gets called, or used to get called, the internal mammary artery. We also have the lateral thoracic artery down here, which is coming down to serratus anterior, lateral to the thorax, that can supply blood to the breast. And then, then we have a thoracoacromial artery, also extending down to supply blood to the breast. Those are all branches, well, except for the intercostal arteries, those are all branches of the subclavian and then axillary arteries. So those are supplying blood to the breast, and the venous drainage is similar. The other structures of note within the breast are connective tissue structures. In between these lobules, we find uh, what we call suspensory ligaments, um, Cooper's ligaments. And these suspensory ligaments pass from the posterior parts of the breast to anchor into the skin of the breast. So those suspensory ligaments are attached to the skin and they're supporting the weight of the breast. So the suspensory ligaments give the breast uh, shape. And that's important. If we consider some of the changes that occur, um, in before puberty, the breasts of boys and girls, of male, the male and female breast, is very similar. Um, there's a simple nipple, there is a, a rudimentary duct system deep to the nipple, um, and, and little else. And during puberty, And during puberty, the, in, in the female breast, um, of course, in the female during puberty, there's an increase in the amount of estrogen. So the female breast responds to that estrogen and the duct system becomes longer, more complicated, and mammary gland tissue starts to form. And in the male breast, um, it doesn't see any estrogen. So normally that doesn't occur. It can occur, of course. And if we see um, breast development in the male chest, then that's gynecomastia. Um, so that can be caused by all sorts of sources of, of estrogen. Um, one source is anabolic steroids, surprisingly enough. So bodybuilders that take anabolic steroids and take androgens, if you take a lot of anabolic steroid, um, some of that is broken down. If you look at the metabolic pathway, it will become um, forms of estrogen. And that estrogen... They're building a new chemistry department. And that estrogen will activate the cells within the male breast, just as it would in the female breast, and cause development of the breast, fat deposition and, and so on. The other important consideration there is that if these ducts exist in the male breast, then there is a possibility of male breast cancer. And that is a possibility. It's, it's far less likely than female breast cancer for hopefully obvious reasons. Um, but it does occur, um, some hundreds of patients a year in the UK, I think. Um, so consider that in your male patients, uh, unusual changes in the male breast. If it's not gynecomastia, then it could be a form of cancer. Okay, so then we have changes during puberty, and the female breast develops to, see, to give the, the adult female breast and the structure that we see here. Um, and then, of course, those tissues are able to respond during pregnancy to other changes in hormones. And the breast enlarges and the, the glandular tissue increases massively. In fact, the glandular tissue um, pushes a lot of the fat out of the way. And this, if this is a lactating breast, it becomes much larger. The nipple and the areola change colour. And the glandular tissue um, becomes dominant. It fills the breast. And of course, close towards um, the time of birth, late in the stages of pregnancy, um, the mammary gland tissue starts to produce colostrum and starts to produce milk. And this is an active lactating breast. And if you look at sections of active breast under the microscope, then it is very much filled with um, 
mammary gland tissue and much less fat and connective tissue and so on. Um, we were talking about these lactiferous ducts all opening at the nipple. You can see on these models we have these lactiferous sinuses. These lactiferous sinuses are, 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 have generally been regarded to be swellings of the lactiferous duct just before they get to the nipple. And the idea being that when the baby is suckling on the nipple they squeeze those lactiferous sinuses which have milk in them and, and, and the milk is squeezed out. Recent ultrasound studies suggest that these may not actually exist or may not be what we think they are. So our understanding of the breast is continuing to change. So during pregnancy the breast becomes a lot larger, there's less fat, there's a lot of mammary gland tissue that becomes an active gland. Now the baby is breastfed for however long and when the baby is weaned um, that causes another cycle of changes of, of hormones and this glandular tissue within the breast starts to involute again. It starts to regress, it starts to shrink and it starts to revert back to the amount of glandular and duct tissue that there was um, in the inactive breast, the non-lactating breast. Um, but of course as the breast has become much larger those connective tissue structures, those suspensory ligaments we were talking about, have become stretched which means that the breast will be a different shape most likely after pregnancy, after breastfeeding to before. So the breast will become smaller than the lactating breast and it'll be a different shape after pregnancy. So that's a normal change. Um, and then And then the inactive breast is able to respond again to those hormones of pregnancy to become a lactating breast and that cycle can repeat itself. The other change that occurs um, is at menopause and at menopause changes in hormones occur again and the breast responds to those changes. It's interestingly actually during the menstrual cycle there are changes to the levels of progesterone and what have you right and estrogen and the breast will respond to those the breast will change slightly during um, the menstrual cycle as a side note but with the cessation of menstruation with menopause and the loss of many of those hormones the glandular tissue within the breast will again involute and it'll start to disappear and the duct system will get smaller and also start to disappear. And there are some other changes that can occur such as the amount of fat in the breast might increase or the amount of fat in the breast might decrease. Um, and these again, these are normal changes that occur with menopause. Again, of course, with age and with changes in circulating hormones, connective tissues in our bodies change. So the activity of fibroblasts, the maintenance of connective tissues is reduced. Um, you know, the skin becomes more friable, less stretchy as you get older and as you expose it to sunlight. Likewise in the breast, those suspensory ligaments become less strong, less firm, less tough. They probably stretch more easily, which means there, there are also changes to the shape and often size of the breast with menopause. So that's another normal change during the life cycle, as it were. However, if we're talking about cancers, if, we, if a mass starts to develop in the breast, then it may change the shape of the breast because you may be able to see that mass or palpate that mass, but it may cause other shape changes which you should be aware of. For example, if a mass starts to develop, it can it can interfere with those suspensory ligaments and shorten those suspensory ligaments and because those ligaments attach to the skin it can cause some strange dimpling effects the skin gets pulled in this is a very abnormal very unusual shape change to the breast that you should be worried about um, uh, also those masses might interfere with the ducts and they might invade blood vessels and lymphatics and invade into the, the ducts if they didn't start there in the first place and link up these structures. So blood or fluid leaking from the nipple may be a sign of those structures inside the breast being compromised and linked. Um, the nipple itself may get inverted as the tumour starts to pull on those ducts which pull on the nipple. So the shape of the nipple might change or might become inverted. These are things to worry about. Also, if Also, if the lymphatic drainage of the breast is compromised, if fluid is less able to drain from the breast, then you might start to get an inflammatory uh, cancer. You might start to see signs of inflammation and swelling of the breast, and you might see, start to see dimpling, uh, peau d'orange, an orange peel appearance on the skin um, because of those changes. So those would be abnormal, unusual changes in the breast, which should concern you, and you should... Um,
But there are a num number of normal changes that uh, occur to the breast through life. So, the lymphatic drainage of the breast, well, um, the, the parts of the breast will drain in different directions. So the medial breast is most likely to drain to parasternal lymph nodes, and these are, these are deep to the sternum and the ribcage. You can't palpate these. In fact, there is some crosstalk through both sides, so it's possible for cells, uh, if you're thinking about the spread of metastatic cells, to pass from one breast to another through that route. Um, and, then those, and then those parasternal nodes will drain superiorly. Um, the lateral parts of the breast and superior parts may drain to axillary lymph nodes, so lymph nodes in the axilla which are also draining the upper limb. And we have groups of axillary lymph nodes which are worth looking at and these drain through subsequent groups to around the clavicles, you have infraclavicular and supraclavicular lymph nodes and then those drain back to the, the venous system. So remember you've got the, the right lymphatic duct over here and the thoracic duct over here and those drain into roughly the point where the internal um, jugular vein meets the subclavian veins, they drain in there somewhere. So if, if lymph is draining up here, it'll drain into blood vessels before you can palpate any, any lymph nodes. But then that means that the axillary lymph nodes are potentially sentinel lymph nodes for breast cancer, for metastatic, metastatic, spread, of, for metastatic spread of cells, cancer cells from the breast to axillary lymph nodes. So these are lymph nodes you should be concerned about. Of course, if these lymph nodes are removed with surgery, then that means that lymphatic drainage from the upper limb is also going to be compromised. So the patient might, might struggle with edema and swelling and fluid accumulation in the upper limb. Also, it's not really shown here, but the breast extends up into the axilla. There's an axillary tail to the breast. So if you're palpating the breast looking for lumps and masses, uh, you should always remember that the breast extends up into the axilla so you should continue up there. Likewise surgeons must remember of course if they're doing a mastectomy and removing breast tissue that the axillary tail st extends up there. There's something else that's interesting, what was it? Uh, accessory nipples. I used to teach this and give examples of, of, <laughs> of people in popular culture that have ex extra nipples um, and as I've gone through the years I've found that Students don't recognise the examples I give. Um, but interestingly, in the embryo, there are ectodermal ridges that form. And these are the milk lines. And in other animals that have many, many nipples, um, the nipples will form along that ectoder ectoder ectodermal ridge. So there's a bunch of signalling going on, right? nipples form breast form. In, in humans we tend to only get two nipples and two breasts but it is possible for some humans some people do have extra numerary nipples um, and if an extra nipple forms it's usually going to be on that milk line so extending from the milk line the, the, the nipples here kind of down towards the inguinal region there so they're not like randomly spaced over here. Scaramanga, James Bond right when he stuck his extra nipple on it was over here somewhere wasn't it? It would, wouldn't be there it would be on the milk line Supernumerary nipples are um, usually not a problem, not particularly interesting. They often look like a small mole, but because they're on the milk line, you can guess that it's an extra nipple. Okay, I hope, hope you enjoyed the sounds of drilling and falling masonry as much as I did. <laughs> and um, there's the anatomy of the breast. So the structure is straightforward. The most important ideas are the normal changes that occur through life and being able to recognize those abnormal changes. And if you think about the cells, If you think about the cells and the histological structure of the breast, you will understand the different forms of breast cancer more easily. Okay. You should always tidy up after yourself. Mm -hmm.